Picture today a surgical scene, a sterile room, bright lights, instruments clean. Patients today know they'll be safe, but lo long ago this was not such the case. What once was called surgery was nothing sort, and began when such things were of desperate resort. From the New Age tone, 4500 BC, where whole drills and skulls were the best you would see. With these crude efforts and novel intentions, only turpentine vinegar might stave off infections. And for these poor patients, through their holes and their gones, nothing they're offered is the slicing of bone. Flash forward some years to the ancient Egyptians, learning of organs through mummifications. T'was known that honey kept infection at bay after they saw that forceps had had their way. The Greeks also made tools for their own resection and found that wine helped ward off infections. Gladiators strive with Galen around, who studied the body slicing on beasts that he found. Clearly surgery before anesthesia was simply barbaric, excruciating pain making patients hysteric. But this was the time to be awake without key, to come out alive of your surgery. In India, years later, cross all the land, nose open nose was sliced off by hand. As punishment, yes, which was the worst, the loss of her cure, no stitch back with force. Through the middle age, this agony of pain continued leaving the needy withering in vain. As unconscious of herbs attempt to mask the unspeakable agony of resolute surgeon's task, here soon emerged a brand new vocation. Barber surgeons pulled teeth and did amputations. Inside of their shops, your wounds hit repair, and for a spare child, and he'd trim up your hair. At this time in large cities emerged a disease that would root off your face while spreading with ease. Quite this scandal, but surgeons and skin graft could save you in weeks. The pain by stitching your arm to the side of your cheek, but here education humbly begins to improve how surgeons could heal their kin. Those students were faced with dubious team, forced to steal cadavers to the sake and to learn, finally from darkness, a turn that advances, with the arrival of chloroform, ether and gases, which tamped the edge of all this pain, thought significant risk of dying remain. But then new technologies wrote realizations, like how globes made of rubber could aid sterilization, and through the germ theory, new insights came. Why simply washing one's hands could help patients survive. So by the mid-90s, surgery was safe. Antibiotics haven't found their true place. Amen's better schooling and doctors who shared the skills just to heal but also to care. Now the term healthcare means thousands of tasks, thousands of roles built on the past. And with esteemed institutions teaching was right, the history of surgery's future is bright. Hello everyone, so in today's episode we are going to learn about Henry Albert Hartman's life. So please join us. Uh, hello, students. Good morning, teacher. Hello, doctor. Well, today we have a very special guest. You can ask any question you have. Feel com comfortable, and I leave you with the Dr. Bergeret. Good morning. I am the Dr. Bergeret. I am here to talk about anything you want to know about Harman, because I was very close to him. Hi, doctor. How are you? Fine, thank you. Hello, Doctor. Could you please tell us more about his life? Of course, Lorena. He was a very close friend of mine. I remember... With a nice pass over the reef, comes across that right... Uh-oh, she's looking at us. Uh, what did she say? What? Oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? I remember so many things. 
Henry Albert Hartman was born in France on June 16, 1860. Since he was a young, he showed a great interest in medicine. When he entered the School of Medicine of Paris, he began expressing an excellent performance as a student. And besides this, he acquired a particular affection for macroscopic anatomy. Hartman was a disciple of Terrier, who promoted in his students the virtues that served him well in his professional development. Later on, Hartman stood out as a great teacher and because of his contributions to medicine through his anatomic procedures and descriptions. He was the only child of the chemical Charles Antoine Hartman and Octavie Mary Koenig. He grew up during the Napoleon III Empire while Paris underwent the most significant urban transformation in its history, in which they would carry out the necessary changes to make it the most modern city in the world at that time, a time that some call the golden age of capitalism. The surgeon and teacher Dr. Henry A. Hartman served as an excellent surgeon. In keeping with his character, Hartman's surgical technique is characterized by attention to the smallest details, a trait that he transmitted to all his assistants. He learned from Terrier uh, how to meticulously suture homeostasis because his teacher quoted Polish surgeon Johannes von Mikulix. I can tell a good surgeon no by the way he makes his incisions, but by the way he makes his incisions. What a suture! He detested those who pretended to put on a show in the operating room. In contrast to his lectures, Hartman operated in silence and only after the, operate, the operation did he carefully describe to his students what he had done. Throughout his successful career, he performed a thousand or more surgeries each year for 20 years. Like any exemplary doctor, he wrote exact notes on each procedure and the course of the postoperative phases. Works and eponymous. He showed interest in various fields of medicine, but he leaned toward the surgery of the digestive system. He performed the first esophageal diverticulectomy and duodenostomy with success in Paris. He was the first to describe hypertrophic pyloric stenosis in adults, TBC in the system, and a pseudomyxoma appendicular. Some of his works were Surgery of the Stomach in collaboration with Terrier in 1899, Surgery of the Rectum in collaboration with Edward, and Less Anastomosis Intestinal and Gastrointestinal in 1906. He also published about breast surgery, biliary and gastric surgery. He also wrote about gastrointestinal tract such as bile duct surgery, surgical treatment of stomach cancer, and carcinoma of the sigma colon. He later wrote his surgical technique in detail in his book Surgery of the Rectum, but was established and published in 1931 and constitutes volume 8 of Strabox of Surgery. His works on lesions of the ileocecal valves area that are presented at the London Medical Society are considered the most complete. In the early years of the last century, he performed seven resections with a single death. The operation consisted of establishing a new anatomical arrangement between the ileum and the cecum that are closely resembled to the normal arrangement. He described the ampulla in the distal part of the neck of the gallbladder, which is considerable, very important to surgeons. Since it's very useful for the identification of the cyst dust and a greater importance to perform a cholecystectomy, this is known, given as a Harman bag. Tell me, Gorilla, I see that you have the hand raised. 
Yeah, doctor, I have a question. What about his contributions in medicine? That's a nice question because he made a lot of contributions. For example, he acquired a particular affection for macroscopic anatomy. In 1881, he, fe he finished his studies at the University of Paris. He was doubting his interest between medicine or surgery, so he talked to Pierre Merkel, who was an Alsatian doctor, who advised him to enter the recently opened Bichard Hospital, where Felix Terrier was considered one of the most authoritative surgeons in Paris and who was renewed for having performed the first hysterectomy there. Passing the entrance exam to carry out his internship, Harman became the first terrier intern who would be his mentor for the next 15 years. So much was the respect and admiration he had for his teacher, the ones he wrote. This is the teacher who made me a sergeant. In 1882, he joined Terrier at the moment he adopted the principles of sterilization. For the 10 years later, Terrier's surgical, surgical service at Bichat Hospital became a testing ground for doctors from different places to observe and learn the aseptic techniques of surgical procedures. In 1884, he demonstrated a special interest in surgery, so he started working as an assistant in the anatomy laboratory in the hospital of Bichat. In 1886, at the end of his surgical formation, he became interested in the genitourinary system and presented his thesis as an advisor to Jane Newton to graduate in 1887, which he entitled with which was the winner of the award the Argentuil. His advisor Newton, one of the fathers of modern Orology in France encouraged him to be the head of the urology service at the Larivosier at the Larivosier Hospital, where he stayed for a short time while he was head of the service. He held several successive positions in Paris Hospital until finally he returned to the family atmosphere of Bichat Hospital and the Terrier Company. The doctor Henry Hartman had a lot of important titles such as member and founder of the French uh, Urology Association. He was a um, honorary fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons on, of England and Ireland. He was a fellow in the American Surgical Association. He was the president of the Surgery Congress in France. Also, he was the president of the International Congress of Surgery in Warsaw, uh, Poland. Um, and he was the president of the Academy of Medicine in 1936. He served as professor of appliance operations, replacing Edward A. Kinnerman a French surgeon. In 1912, he was professor of surgical clinics in substitution of Paul F. Segund. In 1915, he became the holder of the first chair of surgical clinic at the most traditional center, the Hotel Liu, God's Hostel. In this place, he gave the chair in replacement of Jean Giretlus in a short time. He became a full professor and late president of the Department of Surgery. He remained in this position until his retirement, which occurs in 1930, without abandoning the practices of surgery. It is said that when he retires, he left meticulous records of more than 3,000 cases that he had personally treated and that are preserved today in the archives of the Hotel Dieu. 
of the Assistance Public Hospital in the Paris. Hartmann trained several generations of surgeons, attached great importance to teaching in his clinic's lessons and in the session that he used to give every Tuesday at the hospital with great eloquence and a particular way to speak in. His lessons were based on facts, general knowledge and common sense. He taught his disciples to take notes to place special emphasis on the methodical and through physical examination of the patient, while remaining respectful and courteous to him, about which he published a work in La Presse Medicale in 1913. He showed respect and humility before specific exact facts. As an example of this, in 1920, he abandoned the use of hysterectomy for the treatment of cervical cancer, even though he had contributed to the surgical therapy when it was recognized that radiotherapy was superior. The students did not always enjoy the most optimistic interactions with Hartmann, as he preferred to call himself H.H. He had a peculiar teaching style that includes a tendency to ask questions of students in a sarcastic and humiliating way. See that we have some question. Leonardo, tell me, what do you want to know? Yes, doctor. Uh, could you tell us how the Dr. Harman developed uh, the procedure? Of course, I can tell you. Harman's procedure first described in 1921 in the 30th French Surgery Association Congress. Harman reports two patients with obstructive cancer of the sigmoid colon, whom he treated by performing laparotomy with creation of a proximal colostomy and sigmoid resection with closure of the rectal stump. This procedure was initially taught for patients with rectal cancer. Initially, it was for patients who had acute colon and rectum illness that required emergency surgery. The procedure first consists in the removal of a colon segment that contains an acute inflammatory area with or without the presence of perforation or fistula. Second, the diseased area is removed and the bowel is not rejoined. The procedure implies creating an alternative path for faces to be paced. Third, once the affected part of the colon has been removed, the healthy end of the large bowel is brought to the surface of the abdomen to form a stoma and opening the, the oval. This type of stoma is called a colostomy and may be temporary or permanent. Fourth, the non-functioning ending of the bowel is usually still closed inside the abdomen. Five, occasionally the non-functioning and may be brought to the skin surface to drain. This is called a mucous fistula. Colostomy is performed in the first time surgery while bowel portions are attached in a, in a second time surgery. He developed this procedure in response to a highly mortality, 38% in his patients who had have undergone an abdominal peritoneal resection. The procedure is perhaps most commonly used in the treatment of the complicated diverticular disease as an alternative for the three-stage procedure developed by Maggio and Rankin and Brown. There are several reasons for this. A proximal colostomy does not control the inflammatory process in the distal colon. Distal colon removal even after several weeks can be difficult and dangerous to inflammation and colostomy closure risk multiple operation for it. Another reason is that explain why it was replaced the third stage procedures to Harman's is the significant difference in the mortality rate being respectively 44 44% and 14%. The operation that in Montalis, Professor Harman is still used in the management of carcinoma and as well the treatment of other conditions 
such as perforated or obstructing tumors, bulbulus of the sigmoid colon, ischemic colitics, traumatic colonic perforation, and radiation injury. I can see that Marijuana has a question. Tell me. Yes, doctor, good morning. Good morning. Uh, to finish, I would like to ask how he died, what happened to his life. Okay, that is a terrible history. Um, Hyman was awarded various titles, recognitions, and honors. After his jubilation in 1930, he still continued helping other medical societies. Cancer treatment occupied a large part of his professional endeavors through his career. He was advocate for the early detection of cancer, for which he contributed basic scientific research with surgical and not surgical treatments. Harman had no children so he spent time with his students when they visited him, advised them on issues beyond the file of medicine, especially young people who came from rural town. His house had a warm atmosphere and cozy, which contained a huge medical library. The last hours of Henry Hartman's life were spent surrounded by students who used to visit him on January 1st. On the first day of January, without his late wife, after his guest had left, he slipped while going up to his room and fell down the stairs to his death. He said his end was adequate, without illness, in full possession of his faculties, at the age of 91 years. Harman died in Paris on January the 2nd, in 1952. Harman left a model of professional excellence and a high level of moral quality as a human being. Uh, it was all. Thank you for the time. Dr. Bergeret, thank you a lot for this uh, meeting. Uh, it was it was a pleasure, and well, thanks. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Thank you, Doctor.